Right before we jump into this video, I want to ask you, how do you keep track of all of the serial numbers for the gear that you have, just in case something ever gets stolen? Well, that's what I thought. You really don't have a good method to do it. But that's why I've created my Gear Vault, the best way to input, organize, and protect your gear. You can download it for free right now at mygearvault.com for Apple iOS as well as Android devices. Jared Poland, Frono's Photo. Dot com, and this is the ultimate battle between the Canon 5D Mark IV, Nikon D850, and Sony A7R 3 Now, I have real-world reviews of each one of these bodies where I took them out into a real-world situation, put them through their paces, and am offering you guys up the RAW files to download. You can go to the links down below to download the RAW files to see how those look, to see if you like them or if you don't like them. Now, what I'm gonna do now is go over the specs of these cameras and talk about it from my personal experience using them. Each one of these cameras is fantastic in their own way. There are pros and cons to all of them right here, and I will wrap it up at the very end with which ones I think you should go with. First things first, let's look at pricing. You have $31.99 for this body, or $32.99 if it has C-Log for the 5D Mark IV. The D850 is the most expensive at $3,300, and the Sony a7R three clocks in at just under 3200 bucks so obviously they're all pretty similar across the board now let's move on to the sensor sizes the canon has a 30.4 megapixel full frame cmos sensor the d850 is 45.7 megapixels full frame has no olpf and the sony is a 42 megapixel full frame bsi cmos sensor that also has no OLPF. So without the OLPF, you're looking at getting sharper images out of these two bodies versus the Canon right here. But across the board, they are all very similar. Now moving on to ISO, the Canon goes from 100 to 32,000 natively expandable to 102,400. The Nikon does 64 to 25,600 natively expandable, all the way down to 32 as a low, all the way up to 102,400. 400, and the Sony does 100 to 32,000 expandable to 102,000. 400. Now I've pushed the Canon all the way up to that 32,000 when I shot it in a music studio and it held up. Now when I say held up, it had a lot of noise and grain, but it did a very nice job and I was happy with the results. The Nikon on the other hand, I've pushed it pretty far as well and have been happy with the results that I got there. But just remember, you're not going to get the same high ISO capability as you would with something like a Nikon D5. So these aren't the cameras that I'm going to push to the major extremes, but you can push them fairly far and still get great results. The Sony, I've pushed it over 4,000. I've pushed it to 6,400. I haven't gone terribly too far with it, but it's held up fairly well. And I think you're gonna see similar results across the board. Now where the Sony may come in handy and may be better and may win out is the fact that it has built in five axis stabilization, which means you may be able to drop the ISO because you can have better hand holdability because of that five axis in camera stabilization. Now keep in mind that the Nikon and the Canon only get image stabilization for photos when you pop a lens on the front of it that has either IS or VR. So who gets to check mark in this situation for ISO? It's a toss up. So throw one up in the air and wherever it lands, it lands. No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't land wherever. It, it, it's really a toss up. They're going to be very similar across the board and I'm pretty happy with the results from all of them. Though, when you think about it, the Nikon does do 64 natively, which some people for landscapes may find that to be useful, but also 100 ISO isn't that far off from 64. Now, for those of you who like to motor drive, how many frames a second can you get? You get seven with the Canon, you get seven with the Nikon, but if you get the Nikon D5 battery inside the grip for this camera, you can shoot nine frames a second. And with the Sony, you get 10 frames a second. Now that comes with a caveat because that's in 12-bit compressed RAW. Now, if you want to shoot uncompressed 14-bit, that's where you're going to get eight frames a second, but that still beats out the Canon and the Nikon natively. So where am I going to give the check marks in this situation? I'm going to give two check marks. One to the Nikon because you can add that grip and get nine frames a second and one to the Sony for doing the best job natively 
right out of the box. But there is one thing I need to let you know about the Nikon. If you want to get those extra two frames a second, it's going to cost you almost a thousand bucks because you have to add the grip. You also have to add the Nikon D5 battery, which means you also need to add the really expensive $375 or so Nikon charger but it still gets a check mark for having the option available. Next up, let's talk about autofocus. The Canon gives you 61 autofocusing points with 41 of them being cross type. The Nikon gives you 153 point AF system with 99 cross type. And then the Sony will give you 399 point phase detect AF system with 425 contrast detection areas with 68% coverage. Now that 68% coverage when you're looking through the viewfinder almost seems like it covers the entire frame. The Nikons more so it's in the middle of the frame and then the Canon of course with 61 is going to be pretty similar to what you see with the Nikon. Now all three of their autofocus systems have done a great job when I've shot them for portraits, for action, for landscapes. Of course you don't need a lot of focusing points for landscapes but they've all done a very good job. Now what the Sony has that neither the Nikon or the Canon has is what's called IAF or I detect. That is a tremendous feature that I love using. You press a button, it locks in on the eye when you're in continuous focus and it stays on the eye even if the person is spinning, blinking or moving their head. It is a great way to track a subject. Though all of these do a great job with autofocus, something I've noticed more so with the Sony's than I have with the Nikon and the Canons is that it doesn't seem to always be tack sharp. There's situations where I look at the images and I'm like, it's in focus, but it doesn't have that tack sharpness. Now that's not saying that certain images aren't super duper tack sharp. It's just something that I've noticed from time to time in some of my images. But I feel like sometimes with those Sony's just ever so slightly is, is missing, but it may not be enough that other people will notice it. I've noticed it, but then again, I'm not sure other people would notice it because I'm a stickler for being super tack sharp. So how does the autofocus hold up for action shooting? I think the D850 did a tremendous job when I was using it shooting motocross. The 5D Mark IV has always done a great job when I've tracked subjects, or all the Canons generally have done a fantastic job. And the Sony has done a very nice job as well. I tried to shoot some horses galloping to me. Now I haven't used this one as much, much, but I can say being that the focusing system is similar to what you will find in the Sony A9 is that the A9 did a great job when I was shooting soccer. So across the board here, you're going to get fantastic results. But if you're looking for something like the IAF, well, you're only going to find that in the Sony. But really, no check marks are going to give any of these an advantage because they're all really good. Now let's talk about the memory cards you can use in these cameras. The Canon, pretty much using outdated technology by having a CF card and also an SD card, but at least there are two card slots. Not my favorite choice for a modern day camera to have a compact flash card at this juncture. The Nikon D850 uses an XQD card, which is super fast, super durable, super reliable, a great option to have inside a camera, as well as an SD card slot, which is great to have, so you have both. Personal preference, I rather have two XQDs to have the same exact matching and fast cards. And on the Sony side, you have two SD card slots. One is UHS-1, one is UHS-2. Don't know why they didn't have them matching at that point. Personally, I want to go with XQD cards inside of my cameras. That's my personal choice. And, and on a side note, Sony is the maker of XQD. They're the ones who brought it out and they don't put it in their camera. Why don't they put it in a camera like this? Probably because of the size. It would have to make the camera slightly larger, but in my opinion, it would make it better for shooting stills. It would make it better for shooting video to have an XQD card in there. So where am I giving the check mark? I'm giving a check mark to one camera right here and that's going to the Nikon. So now that we know what memory cards are inside these cameras, how many frames in a row raw can you get before you fill up the buffer? The Canon gives you 21. Now that's not too good for a modern day camera to have 21 in a row. The Nikon will give you 51 lossless compressed 14-bit RAW files in a row. Now, when I was shooting 14-bit uncompressed 100 megabytes per file, I was not getting 51 frames. I'm pretty sure inside the camera, it was telling me I had about 25 or 26 remaining shots when I was shooting. But keep in mind, because you have that XQD card, it's going to get the files off the buffer much quicker, which means you shouldn't really outrun your cameras. Now, with that being said, you shouldn't really ever 
never be motor driving for more than 21 frames anyway. Now that doesn't make up for the fact that the Canon only gives you 21 in a row, but really in most situations, you're never gonna need to outrun the buffer. Now the Sony is being marketed as saying that you can get 76 frames in a row in compressed RAW. But if you want to shoot in the better quality, you're going to get 28 in uncompressed RAW. So you can see there's a lot of different options here. But again, being that the Nikon will give you 51 uncompressed lossless RAW in 14-bit, that one's getting the check mark. Being that video is something that a lot of photographers are looking for today in their cameras, let's look at the video features. Now the Canon offers you a 4K DCI video recording at 30 frames a second and 720 up to 120 frames a second, but the problem is it's not full frame 4K. It's a 1.74X crop factor. So that means any lens that you put on it when you're shooting 4K will be multiplied by 1.74. So it's nice video. It's also a bloated video file as we've seen because it uses motion JPEG, but it does give you a nice 4K option. Now the Nikon D850 will give you full frame 4K recording in UHD up to 30 frames a second and will give you 1080 up to 120 frames per second. Now that is a great feature to have inside the camera to be able to do 120 frames at 1080. Now moving on to the Sony, you will get full frame UHD 4K recording at up to 30 frames a second and it also does 1080 at 120 frames per second. Now which one is the best option here? Well, I think there's two best options because they shoot full frame, but the Sony definitely gets the green check mark this time because it does the 5K oversampling and that is a great feature to have. Let me jump in here real quick and let you know that I have four different educational guides that you can check out free previews of at fronosphoto.com slash guides. We have the Fronos Photo Guide to Getting Out of Auto, the Fronos Photo Flash Guide, the Fronos Photo Guide to DSLR Video, and the Fronos Photo Guide to Video Editing. I just want you to know that your support is greatly appreciated and that's what helps us keep going and making these videos. So now, Let's get back to the comparison. So moving on to autofocus as it pertains to shooting video, the Canon has the best of all of them in my opinion because it has dual pixel AF, which is freaking tremendous if you've ever shot with it. If you haven't, I highly recommend doing it. Now the Nikon for autofocus continuous for video is terrible. We'll just leave it at that. It's not really an option if you're looking to shoot continuous autofocus. The Nikon isn't giving it to you. Now the Sony has full-time autofocus with face detect, which does a very good job, but I still prefer the dual pixel AF in the Canon. But I will say when we were out in Sedona with the Sony a7R 3 that we used the face detect AF continuous for shooting video for the entire real world review and it did a very good job. So check marks, uh, let's give two. We'll give Canon a check mark and we'll give Sony a check mark. Moving on to the screens that you'll find on the back of these cameras, you have a 3.2 inch 1.6 million dot touchscreen on the Canon. You have a 3.2 inch 2.36 million dot tilting touchscreen LCD on the Nikon. I will say I love the screen on the Nikon more than I love the Canon. It's much crisper, much clearer, especially when you're out in bright daylight. And on the Sony side, you have a three inch 1.4 million dot tilting touchscreen LCD as well. But I will say out of all three, the screen is not as good on the Sony as it is on the Canon. And the Nikon, I think, has the best option of all of them. With that being said, the Sony is the only one here, because it's a mirrorless camera, that has an EVF. It's a 3.7 million dot EVF, which is tremendous for getting your exposure right, because you're looking at your exposure as you're changing your settings. That's why I love an EVF. Now, if you're in super bright daylight trying to shoot video, you can still use the EVF to shoot video when you are in bright sunlight, where it makes it much more difficult to do that natively without loops when you're shooting with the Canon or the Nikon. So check mark for the best EVF of all of these cameras, 
goes to the Sony. Check mark for best LCD screen or the best screen on the back of the camera. I'm definitely giving that one to Nikon. Now that I've already given the check marks, I do want to add that the Canon is the only camera here that has full touchscreen functionality, meaning you can touch the menus, you can do pretty much everything with the touchscreen, but you can't get that same full touch functionality in the Sony or the Nikon. So we're just going to slide across a check mark for the Canon in this situation. Now let's talk about some next level technology that these cameras may offer because the Sony offers you something called pixel shift technology. Now what it's doing is taking four pictures using the electronic shutter and using the five axis stabilization to move one pixel at a time to give you four pictures that when you stitch them together later gives you a much higher quality image. Now the Nikon doesn't offer you anything like that right now. The Canon on the other hand offers you something called dual pixel, meaning when you take a picture, it's going to double the file size, it's going to slow down your shooting, and the only software that can open that is the Canon software, and what it lets you do is basically shift the focus ever so slightly. It's a cool technology, it's just not worthy of a camera just yet, so for the coolest technology with pixel shift, Sony's getting a check mark. Now let's look at some of the body features that may help you make a decision when you're deciding on what camera to go with. The Canon has its typical joystick, which is great for moving your focusing points, but no added frills and thrills and other things. Where the Nikon offers you backlit illuminated buttons, which comes in handy if you're shooting in darker situations. It also has the joysticks and it also has some custom function buttons, which the Canon has as well, but it's nice to have that backlit illuminated buttons. They really do come in handy. And now the Sony offers you a new joystick, which you didn't find on the A7R2. So it's nice to have that for moving your focusing points, but it also has the ability to allow you to use your thumb on the bottom of the touch screen, or you could set it wherever you want it to be. I recommend setting it on the bottom right, but you can, while you're shooting, move your thumb across the LCD, and that's going to move your focusing points. That is an awesome feature. Now, Canon offers that in some of their mirrorless cameras, so maybe one day they will offer it in their SLRs, but check marks, let's see. Check mark goes to Sony for having a cool feature of that touchy thing, and then Nikon for the backlit illuminated buttons, and Canon, you can cry in shame. So if you're somebody who shoots tethered, you'll be happy to find that the Canon has a USB 3 port for tethering, the Nikon also has a USB 3 port for tethering, and then the Sony has upgraded to a USB-C for tethering, and not only will it allow you to tether, but it will also charge your camera at the same time. So check mark, super check mark, Dan, make this a super check mark, goes to the Sony. Now let's talk about battery life. We all know that the Sonys have done terrible jobs with their battery life in the past, but now that they've switched up to the Z battery, it's doing a much better job. I can shoot for quite a while and the battery trickles and it's not as bad as it used to be, so that's a plus. The Nikon, on the other hand, has a really good battery in there and I think you're going to get a ton of shots with it, more so than you would with the Sony. And then the Canon, battery's just as good as well. I still think that the Nikon's going to edge the other ones out based off of what Nikon is saying, but I don't think you're going to see too much of a difference. But if you need more power, you can add a grip to all of these cameras. That means you'll get two batteries in the Canon, that means you can get two batteries in the Sony, and it means you can get interesting with the Nikon, because you can have two batteries in there, either two of the regular batteries, or you could have a regular battery, and then you could also have the Nikon D5 battery, which is gonna blow these other ones out of the water, but like I said, it's gonna come at a price to have that D5 battery. But they're all doing a great job, but based off of adding a grip and the D5 battery, the best battery life that you're gonna find all around, taking everything into consideration, is the Nikon D850. Now before we get into the weight and size, I know many of you are waiting for the most important test, and that is the wind tunnel test. So I'm going to take a step over here, I actually got shorter, it's okay though, and blow. I gotta try that from over here now. You know this one's a super tough one, even though the Sony is the smallest of all of them, it's more boxy looking, and it really just doesn't do well with the wind. Ooh, the Nikon has this nice little cleft thing going on here. Oh, but the Sony, ah, you know what? The Canon one has this nice rounded edge. 
Cannon's winning the wind tunnel test. Check mark. Thank you, Cannon. So now that the wind tunnel test is out of the way, let's get to the weights of the cameras. The Cannon is 1.76 pounds. The Nikon, ooh, it's a chunky one at 2.01 pounds. And the Sony is super dainty at 1.45 pounds. That's a mirrorless camera. It doesn't have the mirror, it doesn't have the prism. It is much smaller and lighter. You can see it right here. It's a small camera. Now when you add a grip to all of these, they feel very nice in the hands. The Sonys have come a long way from feeling really terrible in the hands to finally putting buttons in places that actually make sense. So they've done a nice job there. The Nikon feels great in the hands. It's a great, well-built body, which out of all of them, if I had to choose one that was more rugged, I would probably say that the Nikon is more rugged, whereas the Sony is a little more dainty because of how it's built. I wouldn't want to drop it, though I wouldn't want to drop any camera. I just think that that's super dainty. Now the Canon, it's built very well. So if weight is your issue, if you want the lightest camera, of course the Sony's going to get a check mark, but don't put it up on the screen yet because that's not the only factor. What you have to factor in our lenses. Once you put a 70 to 200 2.8 on each one of these cameras, they're gonna weigh almost the same exact thing. So you have to remember that, that yes, this is smaller, and a lot of people think that mirrorless means smaller cameras and that's a better thing, but once you put big ass glass on it, well, then they're all gonna weigh about the same thing. So in terms of weight, which one gets a check mark? Well, if we're just looking at weight straight up, we're gonna have to give it to the Sony. But if we wanna talk about the strongest camera out there of them, because it's heavier, I'm gonna go ahead and say the Nikon. But now it's time to wrap it up and tell you which one I think is the best one out there. And the truth of the matter is, they're all very good. In this day and age, you have to break it down to what are you going to use it for. I look at it like this. If you're not invested in any system right now, you have to ask yourself, which camera company do you think makes you happier? Which one is innovating more? And that, for a lot of people, may be the Sony, because Sony is innovating much faster than Nikon and Canon. They still need to add more glass. They're getting there, but they they don't offer the same types of things like an 85-1.2, a 50-1.2, or a 105-1.4 that the Nikon offers, not to mention all the other 1.4s that they have. So if you're just starting fresh, it's almost like you need to roll the dice or flip a coin, a three-sided coin, if that thing even exists, and then pick one from there. But think about which company do you think has the best trajectory for the future and go with that. If I was starting out right now, it would be a very hard decision. I think I would say to the Canon, well, your technology is super duper old and I'd have to decide between the two of these. Then I'd have to decide, do I want a mirrorless or not have a mirrorless? Personally, we know that I'm a Nikon shooter, so I gravitate towards using the Nikon. But there's a lot of great functions, and I didn't even mention that in terms of silent shooting, if you wanna shoot silent, you can do that with the Sony. You can also do that with the Nikon, but you can't use a viewfinder when you do that. And with the Canon, it does have a silent shutter mode, it's pretty quiet, but you have to take that into consideration as well. But if you're already invested in a system, you need to decide what you're going to do. If you already have Nikon glass and a history with Nikon and you're happy with the results there, I'm not jumping ship to the Canon. I'm not jumping ship to the Sony. You need to take that into consideration. Now I've heard from a camera store that I work closely with that they're switching a lot of people over from the Canon side from say 5D Mark III's or also 1DX Mark II's to Nikon D5's and D Nikon D850's. That's something to keep in mind, that a lot of people were upset with Canon thinking that they put a lot of old technology in and they didn't really revolutionize or really take the camera as far as they hoped that it would go. Nikon, on the other hand, did a fantastic job with the D850, so I'm not thinking that people are gonna jump ship from Nikon to go to Canon. They may jump ship to go to Sony, but if you're already heavily invested, I don't see jumping ship as being an option, even if you already have Canon. The Canon camera's great. Yes, some of those features are outdated and they should have been updated, but that doesn't mean a photographer who knows what they're doing isn't gonna get great results. So at the end of the day, it's almost impossible for me to tell you which one of these is the best of the best with Honor Sir, because they all offer pros and they all have some cons. What do you guys think? Leave the comments down below because it's important to hear what you guys have to say because I like to read those comments as well. So that is where I'm gonna leave it. Thank you guys very much for watching. Jared Poland, Fro Nose Photo. 
Fujifilm.com. See ya. Don't forget I have real world reviews of each one of these cameras. You can click up on the screen right now to check those out. Don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, all of that good stuff. And while we have a couple more seconds, just think about which one you want to click on and click it.